Okay, so this is a lecture on the immunophysiology of the GIT system. Um, it's written more from a physiological perspective, so this is really just a brief overview of the GIT. I'm not going to go deep into sort of immunology and anatomy and that sort of thing. Um, just a brief overview of all the mechanisms of, uh, of, of the immune system that are present in the GIT. Okay, so why, why should we think about the immunity of the GIT? Why would that be important? Well, if you think about it, uh, along with the food that you eat, you're also going to be swallowing bacteria, going to be swallowing viruses, fungi, parasites, toxins, etc., um, etc. Et so the body has to defend itself against all these pathogens that you're swallowing. But not only that, we have a lot of commensal organisms that live in our GIT, and we actually need these commensal organisms for uh, for our own health. The commensal organisms um, uh, regulate the amount of inflammation present in the bowel wall, and uh, they also synthesize vitamin K, among other functions. And um, so on the one hand, we have to kill off all the uh, pathogens that are entering the GIT. On the other hand, we must not kill off all these um, commensal organisms. So there's a sort of homeostasis that exists in the GIT. Um, on the one hand, um, we want uh, increased activity in the immune system when there are pathogens in the GIT to kill them off. On the other hand, we need to be able to tone down immuno the immune system function um, if there is too much damage, collateral damage to our commensal organisms. So we have this homeostasis of the immune system and the GIT, and if we lose this homeostatic um, process, um, we can have uh, we can have a variety of conditions. But um, I think for blockade, especially of note, is the chronic inflammatory states, such as inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, we'll see later how commensal organisms actually reduce inflam inflammatory processes in the bowel, and um, part of what causes inflammatory bowel diseases are, in fact. Um, a loss of uh, commensal organisms or loss of the ability to tone down your inflammatory processes on the bowel. These are the individual components of the GIT that we're going to discuss um, in this lecture. We we'll start off with physical barriers and so on and so forth. Okay, so in terms of physical barriers, um, this is sort of basic first line of defense. Um, our intestinal epithelial cells have very tight junctions in between them in order to try and make it difficult for pathogens to invade um, the t underlying tissue. Not only that, but uh, brush border microvilli and those are the villi on top of the villi also form a physical barrier. Mucin is secreted, which causes a mucus uh, secretion, which forms a physical barrier and uh, this coats all the intestinal cells other intestinal secretions um, that form part of the mucus will also uh, form actual physical layer that prevents direct contact between bacteria and epithelial cells. Mucus deserves a uh, special discussion in and of itself. Uh, mucus is mainly cons consists of mucin, a glycoprotein secreted by goblet cells. Uh, with this mucin we then have a thick mucus layer that coats the intestinal epithelium and uh, in mice, experiments in mice when they had genes knocked out to prevent the uh, mucin uh, secretion mechanisms they end almost always end up having inflammatory bowel disorders due to the lack of the mucus and due to constant bacterial contact uh, and uh, stimulation of inflammation at the epithelium. Okay, so uh, intestinal epithelium is constantly regenerating itself. It uh, regenerates itself about every five days and then sloughs off. Um, so there are intestinal stem cells un uh, underlying the epithelium and they are thus periodically exposed when the epithelium sloughs off and they're ex vulnerable then to pathogen invasion. But uh, we have a defense mechanism called the painth cell they lie at the base of the uh, of the of these crypts, these stem cell crypts. So they stand stand next to the stem cells, and they secrete bacterial enzymes such as alpha defensin and lysozyme. And then the goblet cells secrete a thick mucus uh, at the entrance of the of the crypt of the stem cells crypt, and this actually physically plugs the entrance of the 
stem cell crypt. So those are two mechanisms whereby the stem cells are protected uh, when the epithelial cells slough off. Okay, let's talk about antimicrobial peptides. Uh, peptide is a chain of amino acids less than 100 amino acids long. If it's more than 100, it becomes a protein. So you can think of a peptide as being a baby protein. And they're secreted by the gastrointestinal tract wall into the lumen. And these antimicrobial peptides have antibiotic properties. And they have a wide variety of mechanisms of action. Like, for example, they can disrupt cell walls and cell membranes. And I'm not going to give you the full list of their mechanisms of action because that would be just a lot of information overload. But there's quite a huge long list of mechanisms of action, and people are still arguing about well, the different ways that they can actually kill bacteria. There's a wide variety of these antimicrobial uh, peptides. And Famous examples are your defensins, capillocidins, and your C type lectins. As I said, they're secreted by the wall, uh, gut wall, by epithelial cells, especially your painless cells. And uh, actually, most of these peptides end up being trapped in the mucus layer inside uh, along the gut wall. Um, so, your mucus layer, that we discussed earlier, is not only a physical barrier, but because of these antimicrobial peptides, they're also an antibiotic barrier. Next we're going to talk about gut-associated lymphoid tissue, or GALT. Um, and this consists of Peyer's patches, lymphoid follicles, and the lamina propria, which I'm sure the anatomy lecturers will tell you more about. And most of this GALT info actually is consists of the Peyer's patches. And they um, basically secrete uh, intestinal immunoglobulin A and um, these are th so this is um, lymphoid tissue that's uh, present at the gut wall but remember our mesenteric lymph nodes that drain all the lymph tissue from the gut wall also play an important role and they have their own uh, T cells and macrophages um, and B cells that will react to pathogens or pathogenic um, components that are absorbed by lymph from the intestine. Okay, so zooming into immunoglobulin A. Immunoglobulin A is secreted by plasma cells, present in that uh, gold tissue I mentioned earlier. And uh, about 80% of your, of all your body's plasma cells are actually in the GIT. And most of these guys that are in present in the GIT, most of them secrete IgA. So uh, initially you're born without any IgA, um, but um, the mucosal IgA levels spike rapidly upwards soon after your uh, gastrointestinal tract is colonized when you are a newborn. Um, and you can imagine that if you don't have that GIT colonization, you're going to have abnormalities of your mucosal IgA um, thereafter. Now these IgA molecules are are of a mixed variety. Some of them have a high affinity and are very specific to specific pathogens. Others have a low affinity, but they're broad spectrum. And similar with the antimicrobial peptides, some of them are more sort of part of your intrinsic immunity, and others are um, part of more of your in induced um, immunity. Constant new varieties of these IgA are made um, in response to what's happening to in your intestines due to a process called somatic hypermutation. That basically means that plasma cells are capable of mutating themselves. Um, so they don't just mutate whenever they divide um, through the natural errors that occur during replication, but they are actually capable of, sh uh, of shifting around DNA sequences within themselves, and this is referred to as somatic hypermutation. IgA neutralizes toxins uh, by binding with them and neutralizing them. Uh, it attacks pathogens, and uh, IgA also um, prevents bacteria from being able to stick to the endothelial wall by binding on their receptor sites before they have a chance to bind to the endothelial wall, and that prevents them invading the endothelium. Okay, T cells are also present in the GIT. 
CD4 cells are very abundant between the intestinal mucosa and the lymph nodes that um, catch lymph that's draining from the intestine and this explains a lot um, uh, of the uh, pathology of your HIV patients, of your advanced HIV patients, your AIDS patients. Um, HIV starts attacking all these CD4 cells and starts disrupting a, a lot of your immunity around the GIT and typically your AIDS patients complain of chronic diarrhea, constant diarrhea, recurrent diarrhea. Anyway, you, um, not only that, but we have sp uh, some specialized T helper cells that are present in the intestinal tract. They're only present in the intestinal tract, and they secrete a wide variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines to attract neutrophils and macrophages, and metalloproteases, which are enzymes that destroy um, cell walls. Uh, there are also uh, T regulator cells, which suppress T cell function, uh, and they suppress all this inflammation. Um, while at the same time they stimulate the B cells and the plasma cells to secrete IgA. So uh, these guys are stimulated by the death of other T cells. So what happens is that first your, uh, these um, T cells do uh, their thing and as they kill off pathogens they die off which stimulates regulator cells um, which then um, sort of um, calms down the inflammatory response to prevent excessive inflammation uh, within the bowel. We have antigen presenting cells uh, in the GIT. Um, they present, uh, they, they take up uh, components um, of your antigen, so once your, an or once your pathogens die, certain little components of them uh, will be absorbed by antigen presenting cells and they'll uh, express these components as epitopes on the cell membrane and then T cells will dock with the antigen presenting cells and be stimulated and learn and they will learn about these pathogens and uh, be activated to attack those specific pathogens. And they appear to be regulated by vitamin A, exact mechanism is unclear, but um, Vitamin A deficiency is uh, known to cause uh, dysfunction of the immune system, and um, some t some patients respond uh, to supplementation with vitamin A to specific infections. And the most famous one is measles. Um, if you give a little bit of vitamin A to your measles patients, especially your malnourished patients, they do much better and have much less risk of the complications of measles, as an example. Okay, macrophages and our cells that eat um, pathogens uh, are quite abundant in your intestines. The one unique thing about intestinal macrophages is that they do not secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines. Your peripheral guys will secrete a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines which stimulates uh, T cells and B cells and neutrophils around them um, but they, intestinal macrophages, macrophages do not secrete these pro-inflammatory cytokines they leave that drop to the T cells. Um, not only that, but the intestinal macrophages, is macrophages actually stimulate T regulator cells by secreting interleukin 10. And we saw how T regulator cells actually suppress uh, pro inflammatory uh, cytokines. In other words, the unique thing about the intestinal macrophages is that they have a non inflammatory bactericidal response. And it's thought that the reason for this sort of non inflammatory response is that. Unlike in other parts of the body where your macrophages might be, a, uh, macrophages may be the first line of defense, your intestinal macrophages are more of a cleanup crew. So after that T cell wave of inflammation and the phagocytes are all sort of destroyed and there's lots of little bacterial um, antigens and components floating around, your macrophages clean up all that mess and all that, phagos, uh, all that um, pathogenic junk, all that debris after that uh, wave of T cell inflammation. Okay, last but not least, our commensal bacteria, in other words, the usual gut flora, also play an important role in the immunity of the GIT. We have over 500 species of bacteria that uh, are present in the gut, and uh, some of these guys are, have adapted uh, to the human body, and they secrete cytokines. 
uh, which interact with our own human immune system. And uh, uh, these cytokines can even stimulate and regulate uh, our T cells. So an example, uh, L-rutery, lactobacillus rutili, which is present in uh, probiflora probiotics, they can secrete cyclopropane fatty acids, and they appear to uh, suppress the production of tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So these guys can actually shut down immune system cells that are sort of nearby them uh, and prevent inf uh, inflammation, uh, which makes sense because an inflammatory response is probably going to be a, a very hostile response to L-rutery and L-rutery signals uh, to the immune system through cyclopropane fatty acids that, hey, I'm not one of the bad guys, move along, uh, stay calm, you know, keep calm and carry on. Streptococcus boulardii, uh, if you take that uh, orally, that's uh, been shown to reduce the risk of antibiotic-related diarrhea. Uh, so exactly how it does uh, uh, does that is not clear, but it clearly interacts with the immune system um, uh, to pre uh, and in to prevent that antibiotic-related diarrhea. And fecal transplants, and those transplants of commensal organisms through fecal-like bacterial suspensions, uh, are also shown as uh, being. Uh, research as therapy for Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Clostridium difficile tend to get uh, off the prolonged courses of antibiotics and also other inflammatory disorders of the bowel. So it appears that these bacterial suspensions reduce the inflammatory response uh, in the bowel and reduce the uh, diarrhea and the symptoms of inflammatory bowel disorders. Now your normal sort of commensal bacterial flora will vary according to your site, um, uh, but the most common organisms that are cultured out of all these 500 species are as follows. In your duodenum, we've got Streptococci lactobacillin bacterioides, in our ileum, Streptococci lactobacilli bacterioides and bifidobacteria, and in our colon, uh, Bacteroides, Bifidobacteria, Mubacteria, Peptis, Streptococcus, and Clostridium. And you'll notice a general trend. Over here we've got more of our aerobic organisms, and over here we've got more our anaerobic organisms. Okay, just to give you some added insight in the interaction between the human body and the bacterial flora, if we take a patient uh, with radiation poisoning, someone's been exposed to a massive dose of radiation, that radiation will uh, typically inactivate your uh, immune system cells um, and uh, with the result that you're going to have bacterial invasion of the gut wall and typically patients with, with radiation poisoning die of massive sepsis uh, due to this bacterial invasion. But in experiments done on animals that have been raised in a sterile environment where there was no gut colonization, um, first of all, the immune systems remain hypoactive because there's no bacteria stimulating the immune system to work. But uh, if you then pump them full of radiation, they actually are somewhat resistant to radiation poisoning um, because even though the immune system is knocked out, they don't have bacteria in the colon to begin with, they don't have that bacterial invasion, and they have less risk of developing a massive sepsis, and they are somewhat more resistant, therefore, to radiation poisoning than a normal specimen.